regularly uh, scientific meetings. Uh, this time uh, we have uh, among uh, us uh, American economist, Professor Jean Epstein, and uh, now a short uh, uh, briefing description about uh, his activity. Uh, he has taught economics at the City University of New York and St. John University and hold an MA in the subject from New York Stock, uh, School and uh, an BA in History from Brandeis University. Before joining Barron's, he did uh, 13 years time at the New York Stock Exchange, mainly as a senior economist. He joined Barron's in February 1992 as commodities editor. The following year, Jean Epstein became the weekly first economics editor and the first to write the column, Economic Beat, his responsibility to this day. Since October 2010, he's also been the Barron's Book Review editor. His book, Econo Spinning, How to Read Between the Lines When the Media Manipulate the Numbers, was published by John Wiley in August uh, 2006 and is still available in print and uh, in a Kindle edition. He's made uh, numerous experiences on Fox, CNBC, and uh, BBC, and delivered talks over the years in venues that include Columbia University in New York, the Art Hills Club in Tokyo, Loyola University in Baltimore, uh, Universidad Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala City, and Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. He also moderates, arranged speakers for, and occasionally speak before an open firm called Junto, financed by philanthropist Victor Niederhofer, which meets the first Thursday on each month in Middletown, Manhattan. Professor Epstein, you have the world, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking before you. Uh, I'm uh, figuring out the logistics here. I'm going to ask Alex, would you change the slide when I say change? change. <laughs> and that would be like, of course, then I can, uh, well, I, I think I should probably stand so that uh, everyone can see me. Uh, not a big effort. If I get tired, I will sit down. Uh, Alex, uh, that's, the, of course, the title. I gather that some of you have even seen these slides. So you already know what I'm going to say and already have your questions, comments, and sharp criticisms, which I definitely invite, uh, for sure. Let's, uh, let's keep it lively. Uh, with, with the way we're gonna construct is we'll have an intermission. I'm gonna present a few things about Romania. Would you hand me that, uh, those pages there? Yeah. yeah, so I have my Romanian information in front of me. Uh, and then, sorry, uh, and then we'll have some questions. Uh, could you change slide? Uh, that's the only thing to write down. Otherwise, uh, whatever I say, uh, that's important. You should remember. No need to write it down. But write down my uh, Gmail address, and uh, that's where I get special correspondence. Uh, I have been inspired by people. I'll even mention the name Noam Chomsky, uh, who uh, is an odd person from perhaps somebody like me to admire. But he had a huge correspondence. He would spend 20 hours a week. Uh, responding to queries from anybody because he didn't believe in a one-size-fits-all kind of instruction. If you have a particular question, let's talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and so I try to adhere to that standard as well. I try to answer all my email. And in fact, people are surprised that I not only answer the email, but if they answer me, I answer back. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I occasionally been talk uh, talked about as the kind of person who will not end an argument if you want to continue it. Let's continue forever if we need to. Uh, so uh, write me there if any question that you have uh, has not been answered today. Uh, I, I want to begin, uh, before I discuss the Economic Freedom Index, uh, I want to begin by just establishing my credo, um, which might surprise some of you, my credo about economics in general. Uh, that I am a maverick economist. As you can hear from that description, I've bounced around from job to job. Nothing, nothing has quite worked out for me, although for the last 22 years, I've been economics editor at Barron's. Uh, it's called, if you'll excuse the slight vulgarity, a kick-ass publication. Uh, and uh, we, we, it's no holds barred. We can say what we want. 
my employers pretty much know who I am and what I'm like, and they figure out, well, it, it sells newspapers, people read me, uh, I have a strong voice, they get angry with me, so they just let me pretty much do my thing. Uh, but what is my thing to some degree? My th thing is that uh, I feel that the mainstream econ economics as it's practiced uh, suffers from two principal handicaps. The mainstream economists like to pretend that economics is a branch of physics, a branch of mathematics, uh, and I think that this hobbles their thinking. Uh, I can imagine why they like to do this. Everybody likes to feel he's esoteric and that uh, he uh, knows things that others, other people do not know. Uh, uh, and uh, that's a, a wrong and bad turn, I think, that economics took about 50 years ago uh, to make everything mathematical. I think that economics is a branch of human action, uh, and uh, it's based upon insights about human action that, if you think about them, are obvious enough. Uh, the laws of supply and demand, for example, are derived, I think, from thinking simply about human action, about, for example, in the case of demand, we allocate the first uh, units of water to its most urgent use, the next unit to the less urgent use, and so on. We drink it first, then we bathe in it, then we swim in it, then it's a bad. So therefore, we have a, we, we have a descending order of, of orientation with respect to the goods that we buy. That's, that comes from a priori reflection about human beings, the law of comparative advantage, all of those things come from qualitative understanding about human action. And, uh, and I think that they're obvious enough to anybody who wants to reflect on human action. Similarly, we know why the labor theory of value makes no sense, because we don't need mathematics to tell us that. We only need our own reflection on human action. So that's what I think economics is fundamentally about. Uh, even though clearly uh, there are lots of things that we want to verify empirically. I don't deny empiricism, of course, but still we do know uh, that there are certain rules, certain laws, and certain things about economics that are clearly a priori true in terms of our action. We could talk about that more. The second thing that I think hobbles the mainstream is not just uh, that they like to think it's mathematical, but that about two-thirds of them are eager to become either the chairman of the Federal Reserve in New York or the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, or to get some kind of position of power in the world. And that, of course, has to do with the Keynesianization of the economy. John Maynard Keynes, of course, started that tradition. You don't just have to be a journalist like me. You don't just have to be an academician uh, like Alex. You can have power in the world. My God, you can get a PhD and you can be Alan Greenspan, you can be Ben Bernanke. The world is at your feet. Uh, that's very, very seductive uh, to, uh, to the ordinary people. And so since half of them dream about getting that kind of job, uh, what they do and say uh, so much serves the interests of power. Uh, rather than thinking in terms, thinking with all humility, about what economists can really know and what economists can really do. Uh, and so I think that those two things, uh, the desire to think of economics as, as mathematics and the desire to, uh, to sit at the tables of power, very severely hobbles the mainstream in the way they think about economics. Um, I think it's remarkable, however, that many of them do come up with some good ideas. Uh, but normally, actually, it's when they're doing journalism. I mean, I think that's true of Milton Friedman. Uh, the, who, when he did journalism, he thought rationally about economics and often was insightful. Uh, so that's my credo. That's sort of where I begin from. But, uh, but still, we're going to make a transition now to, uh, to something that is called, that is empirical, uh, that, uh, that is called the Economic Freedom Index. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about its implications with respect to Romania. Um, where I'm sure I have a um, great deal to learn from you, uh, and also about the U.S. economy, uh, where uh, I know a great deal, since this is what I mostly cover at, uh, as economist at Barron's. Change slide. Uh, well, the Economic Freedom Index, uh, as those of you who've looked at uh, the charts uh, that, I've, uh, just, that you've seen my displays, know that it's a quantitative index, and we'll get into its guts in a moment, but the overview is that uh, these levels 
uh, the economic freedom index developed uh, in part by the consultation of the free market economist Milton Friedman uh, was an attempt to measure uh, the degree to which an economy, principally government policies, were open to entrepreneurship, open to uh, the workings of the free market. It was an attempt, and of course, like all quantitative attempts, it's only a rough approximation, uh, but I think it's a very noble attempt to measure quantitatively uh, uh, the degree to which an economy is free market oriented and open to entrepreneurship. And uh, there's been about 40, uh, uh, actually uh, not 40, but, uh, but several hundred peer reviewed papers that have been done on the Economic Freedom Index. Uh, and uh, if you write me, I can refer you to some of the literature. And empirically, it does find, and even a lot of these empirical studies have been done by skeptics. Uh, but empirically, they find that if you match the economic freedom index with statistics, then you find indeed that levels of the economic freedom index are highly correlated with levels of income. Rich countries have much higher economic freedom indexes than poor countries. Uh, you second, you find that an increase in the economic freedom index within a country correlates with faster economic growth, a decline with slower economic growth, uh, and that, of course, anticipates what I'm going to talk about with respect to the United States, uh, because that is uh, what happened. Uh, now, you'll find a lot of uh, malign statements about the Economic Freedom Index, a lot of confusion. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, in particular, if any of you have heard of him, is a fairly well-known developmental economist with whom I personally have strong disagreement. Uh, and he maligned the Economic Freedom Index by confusing the issues and trying to talk about how the direction of the index doesn't correlate with levels, and levels don't correlate with direction. The logical point is that a level correlates with a level. The level of the index correlates with the level of economic well-being. The direction of the index within a country, uh, up or down, or, or more slow or more faster, uh, correlates with the direction of economic growth as, uh, or the rate of economic growth as conventionally measured. Uh, next slide. Uh, now the overview of the, uh, is uh, the worldwide rise in economic freedom for 101 countries. They now keep it for uh, 158 or 59 countries. Interestingly, the, the significant omission in the economic freedom index is Cuba. Uh, and uh, I, I, I can only infer why that they cannot get data for Cuba, uh, although they do have for Venezuela and about now 158 countries. But uh, they started out by 1980, they did have measurements for 101 countries. The index is measured on a scale of 0 to 10. We'll get to it some subcomponents, but 0 to 10 is the index. Uh, and uh, this is the global average. It's not population weighted, it's just uh, per country, so obviously China and India might be population weighted. I asked them for population weights, and it turns out that, that uh, they did a rough approximation. You get a similar result uh, even if you, if you population weight it versus just weighting it for countries. And all that shows is that there has been a rise in economic freedom uh, for the 101 countries that have been charted from 1980 uh, through 2013, the most recent year for which data are available. Now, I might mention that the Fraser Institute, which puts this out in conjunction with the Cato Institute uh, in New York, frustrate me as a journalist because uh, my readers like everything to be up to date. Uh, in fact, I mean, a great fallacy, a great problem with covering economic data for a, uh, a, a, a weekly magazine like Barron's, which uh, is about investment, is that they like to think that any economic number has the finality of a market close. I mean, they wanted, they, they're used to market closes. They're used to, you know, what happened uh, an hour ago or a minute ago. And so everybody wants uh, data, of course, to be totally up to date. And there at the Fraser Institute, they're very careful. They deal with the numbers as they come in, and the numbers are often uh, lagging, and they don't want to have a lot of revisions. So the data are a little bit out of date. Uh, unlike, I should say, another economic freedom index that's put out by the Wall Street Journal Heritage Foundation. Uh, if you've heard of that one, uh, then I believe, unfortunately, it's too subjective and, 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 uh, and, and, and I have to use the word somewhat fraudulent. Uh, uh, and uh, because they pretend that they have recent numbers for 2013, 2016, and they really don't. 
Uh, but the Fraser Institute Cato measure is very transparent. It can be reproduced. You can look up all the sources, and you can see exactly how it's calculated. Now, uh, the uh, next slide. Uh, that's uh, just a, a suggestion that the rise in economic freedom uh, since 1980 uh, uh, has, has, I believe, not coincidentally, uh, but causally, uh, brought about uh, a, a decline in the number of people living in extreme poverty, defined as living on a dollar twenty-five or less. This is from the Brookings Institution, which I imagine you've heard of, a very basically a, a mainstream institution. Um, not, they don't have any great, uh, actually, any great love for the Economic Freedom Index, but uh, they have documented they, they've just the immense fact, the immense revolution in, uh, in living standards that uh, the number of people uh, living in extreme poverty defined as a dollar twenty-five or less was cut in half between 1990 and 2010. Uh, that means uh, two billion people to one billion. Uh, obviously, that one billion is still quite poor, but it's an amazing uh, revolution. Uh, they, uh, the, I mean, a billion people uh, lifted uh, out of extreme poverty. Uh, it, dwarfs the Industrial Revolution that Americans like to talk about, the British and, and U.S. Industrial Revolutions uh, of the, of the, of the uh, 1900s. Uh, this has been quite dramatic, and I do suggest that you consider that the Economic Freedom Index has a lot to do with it, the rise in the Economic Freedom Index. Next slide. Uh, the uh, two most populous nations, we should always look at them, um, China uh, and India. You can see where India has bounced around uh, but uh, China and India have both mostly risen, although the rise has been slower most recently. Uh, and uh, that too has been significant. Clearly, they went, uh, China in particular obviously arose from the Maoist economy to uh, a more free market economy. Uh, next slide. Another overview, just the highest and the lowest. Who is number one? You know, we want to know all the rankings. Americans always like to know who is number one. It's invariably been Hong Kong. Even though Hong Kong is a part of China, it is still measured separately. Uh, and um, Hong Kong and Singapore are number one and two. The Republic of Congo and Venezuela are 156 and 157. Again, uh, there is uh, certainly Hong Kong and Singapore standard of living are much higher than the Republic of Congo. and. Venezuela. Next slide. Uh, 10 is hardly perfect. Uh, you know, the uh, woman is a perfect 10. Well, there's no, the, the, the idea of the economic freedom index, I would insist as a free market person, uh, is that it's really not that if you get a 10, you're a perfect capitalist free market economy. Uh, the ratings are essentially marked on a curve, and we'll get to the guts of it a little bit. Uh, shedding light on how each country looks relative to others and relative to its own past. True free market capitalism would be off these charts. I mean, I believe that if the U.S. actually had a free market, then growth of 3 and 4 percent, which is considered high, uh, would be very modest. I believe that a free market economy, if it unleashes all of its entrepreneurial energy, if all of those people who are uh, spending so much of their creative lives figuring out how to circumvent the regulations of government, uh, all those lawyers who, uh, who, uh, who, who teach you uh, how to sue somebody else because that person has done something that is in the eyes of the law wrong, all of that creative energy, if it really were channeled toward entrepreneurship, I believe that any free market economy could grow by 7% a year. And 7% a year means it could double every 10 years in size. Uh, and so uh, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing that impressive even about Hong Kong's measure uh, or about uh, other high measures that approach 9 or 10. Uh, these are just relative measures in the way uh, that they are compiled. A couple of other points. Next slide. Yes, share me. Ahead of me there. Thank you. Okay. Share, share of income earned by the force. Well, this gets to, of course, the other issue I'm going to be lecturing about, which is econ economic uh, inequality. Uh, it's making the point only that uh, uh, it uh, structures the economic freedom index countries according to quartiles, and it shows that the share of income earned by the poorest 10% uh, is obviously low, uh, the poorest 10% 
uh, earn only like two, two and a half percent of the total income, but uh, the, 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 it doesn't change whether you're least free, whether you have a low economic freedom index or high economic freedom index. Next slide uh, is uh, that the amount of income per person earned by the poorest 10 percent is related to economic freedom. And that, to my mind, is the most crucial point, the level point, which is that uh, the most free, we're looking at nearly $10,000 in uh, income per person, and the least free, we're looking at 1,600, you know, 16 percent, 17 percent of, of the of the most free, and that really is, of course, um, what uh, capitalism is all about. Uh, I believe that uh, that certainly there's a lot of inequality of income in our in all economies, the U.S. economy in particular, that I'm concerned about. That has to do with rigging the game. That has to do with crony capitalism, with the ways in which the rich are benefited by government unfairly, in which banks are bailed out by government, where the largesse really, uh, rich farmers are subsidized, sugar interests are subsidized. All of that rigging of the game uh, uh, creates inequality that I object to because of the process. It's, 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 uh, it's unfair, it's forced and fraud, uh, rather than free market transactions. Uh, but by and large, you don't expect a capitalist economy, or indeed any economy really, to have equality. But what you do expect, at least, is that uh, the, uh, the rising tide will lift all boats, which I believe is the case. I believe it's even happened in the U.S. over the last 20, 30 years, even though there are those who question whether it has or not. Uh, but I believe it has happened. Well, what is the Economic Freedom Index? What are we talking about? Well, um, we're talking about five components which are equally weighted. I'm going to go over them briefly. Uh, they take in a whole lot. Uh, again, I, I, I believe the best way to think about these components is if you're familiar with the economics, the free market economics of Milton, Milton Friedman, then you have a pretty good idea of what philosophy it reflects. Uh, size of government, larger government tends to inhibit economic freedom. Uh, the legal system and, pro and security of property rights is the second component which is measured. We're going to get back to that one because it's very important. Sound money. Uh, sound money is measured very much in the way that Milton Friedman would have measured. It has to do with, with measuring inflation, with measuring increases in the money supply. Freedom to trade internationally. Uh, the view is that the more open an economy is to free trade, the better off it will be, uh, the better off the people will be. And then the level of regulation, credit, labor, and business. The, the, the belief is that the tighter the regulation, the less free the economy is. Uh, now I want to begin to segue to something about Romania, which I've discovered, which intrigues me. Uh, the vital importance of the legal system and property rights. Uh, those who devise the Economic Freedom Index have those five components, and they consist of a number of subcomponents. Uh, but um, uh, and they equally weight everything because they want they want to they, they don't want to be thought of as biased. But their research shows, and I quote the Fraser Institute report, a rather extreme statement, which is rather which is pretty intriguing, that countries with major deficiencies in this area, legal system and property rights, are unlikely to prosper regardless of their policies in the other four areas. Uh, another related quote, next slide, um, is that, um, again, this was summarized studies that each year, the Fraser study finds that countries that have good legal rules and protection of property rights are always the high income countries, and countries that rank the lowest in this particular component are the poorest countries in the world. It's almost as though, and again, actually, there's a certain, what you might call redundancy about all of these numbers, they tend to move together. Uh, that uh, if uh, that, that uh, if uh, there's a, if the degree of regulation regulation isn't heavy, then legal system of property rights will be will be reasonable, uh, uh, reasonably good. Uh, if the regulation legal system of property rights isn't heavy, then there will be openness to trade. There's a tendency for these uh, numbers to be correlated with each other, even though they're all contributing a bit. But what's interesting is that uh, it's almost as though you could 
uh, you could dispense with all the other numbers and simply take legal system and property rights, and that would be the key component. It's almost as though most of the story is in that, is in that second component, of legal system and property rights, which brings us to Romania, uh, is moved up in terms of overall economic freedom. That 769 is actually pretty high. It's not far behind the US as it's measured conventionally. But then, next slide. The intriguing thing is that at the same time that the other components have moved up, uh, Romania has moved down in terms of legal system and property rights. Uh, was it 628? Six, that's again a scale of zero to 10. 628, 616, down to 5.74. Uh, I have a, a more recent number for, for 2014, which I asked the Fraser Institute to give me. It's moved up a bit to about 5.94, but it's still uh, fairly low uh, in terms of legal system and property rights. And one would think that, that if, the, if the economic freedom index means anything at all, one would think that uh, that's hobbling the Romanian economy, uh, and that that is significant. Uh, I've asked people about that, and maybe you could tell me something about it. Uh, I probably um, uh, infuriated you in lots of ways already, intellectually. Uh, we've talked about free trade. We've talked about legal system of property rights. We've talked about the degree to which an economic freedom index measuring the free market and entrepreneurship does tend to explain uh, what goes on in most of the world in terms of the other measures of economic well-being and economic growth. And I would imagine that you might have some reflections, comments, criticism to make before we get to the U.S. So I invite you uh, to uh, make a comment, make a criticism, ask a question right now, So, uh, and we'll then we'll go on with the rest of my presentation. So anybody, uh, anybody at all? Yes, sir. Um, well, uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, I think you agree that uh, uh, reality is complex and the economy is complex, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore this element, uh, the economic freedom, is one of the uh, factors that explain, let's say, but not the only one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the comment uh, would be uh, with reference to Romania that uh, we have a rather particular situation in Romania, for instance, in the banking sector, Foreign property of the banks is 92 percent, while in OECD member 92, 92, okay? In, yes. Uh, while in OECD member countries, which is the developed countries, the average is 38 percent. In insurance, is 100 uh, percent. Exports are generated about 85 percent at foreign owned companies. Um, private property is 100 percent in agriculture, 100 percent uh, in uh, housing. And uh, therefore, uh, this is the situation. Of course, this is not related with the level of development. I just give you some figures on the nature or structure of property. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, uh, with so much private property and foreign property, how come that we have that uh, figure over there? Because it's private property. You know, so, well, let me, let me, could you go to the uh, final slides? Uh, can you get, uh, jump ahead? Uh, to the final slides. Go I'll keep going. No, mm -hmm. jump forward, 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 to, forward. The, to the to the end. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, back up, back up. Uh, uh, yeah, for one part of the okay. Uh, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Please forward, forward, forward. To the end. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Stop. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I be, I I should have put this uh, with uh, with respect to uh, my, just to give you a glimpse into the guts. Of the index, uh, and uh, the uh, because you might ask yourself, how are they measuring something quantitative? Uh, and I, I would, took, first of all, analogize this to the blind man and the elephant. We're feeling them in different ways, uh, and, uh, uh, and I, I want to just get specific about property rights. Uh, the uh, they they bring together a whole lot of data from different sources, and uh, this particular uh, uh, aspect. Uh, property rights, which is a subcomponent of legal system of property rights, is a uh, a survey of executive opinion, uh, and uh, you can look uh, this up. Uh, the World Economic Forum they have a specific section on Romania, and they have specifics on 
uh, how many executives from Romania they interviewed. They do some weighting having to do with the size of the company and so on. But they ask the following question, in your country, to what extent are property rights, including financial assets, protected? Now, uh, then uh, on, in, in this particular case, for the World Economic Forum, you put a one if not at all, and you put a seven if to a great extent protected. And uh, the, the view is, on the part of the Fraser Institute, that you, you can ask people a lot of things, a lot of surveys, you know, what do you think of Donald Trump and all that, uh, and uh, you know, they'll say one thing about Donald Trump and they'll vote for him when, the, when it comes down to it. So that's not reliable. But they do believe that when you're talking to executives of companies from Romania, you're getting some information uh, that has to do with their workaday life firsthand. And, so, and, and it's a consensus. So it's not just one executive, but it's a reasonable sample of executives who are expressing their viewpoint. So uh, when they're asked this question, and there's the comparison, uh, the, uh, it's one, uh, not at all seven to a great extent. So 3.9 <coughs> is what we got, which is that it's sort of midway between not at all to a great extent and to a great extent, that property rights are protected. Romania r ranks 98th of all of the countries surveyed in terms of the view of the respect for property rights. Uh, the US is higher. I, I threw in Norway. Um, and, uh, I'm going to show a couple of slides because you know Norway, Sweden, and Denmark are, have been mistakenly conceived of. If you've heard of Bernie Sanders, our quasi-socialist uh, 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 candidate, he's constantly talking about these countries as socialist, when in fact, in most crucial ways, they're more capitalist than the U.S. is capitalist. Uh, and with respect to, to, to right, the property rights, Norway rates uh, near the top. Uh, so that's. Uh, Th that's pretty capitalist in my view, if there's such respect for property rights. So, uh, but, but the real, but, but I would agree with you that the question regresses somewhat backward, which is, the, which is that uh, the virtue of this index is that it's trying to take uh, numbers and uh, based on surveys that are reasonably reliable in order to get a picture of what goes on. But, but you would of course be correct in saying, why are these Romanian executives talking like that? Why don't they say that respect for property rights is great? Well, no, they're not. There's a uh, so we, we, my, my question yes, would be no, sure. why they come. I'm sorry, what? Well, why they come? Because why do they come? I sorry. mean, why foreign companies are coming to such a large extent that oh. they own the banking sector and they own the insurance sector and they own the exporting companies and oh. still it's such a bad situation. Yes. This is my question. No, maybe it is, it is, well, maybe yes. it is related to the fact that we have two million legal disputes on, in courts, yes. on, on land property. Yes, well, yes, absolutely, yes, indeed. But I, I mean, well, you make a good point by the, you're the gentleman in the mustache, but I want to ask you a question. <laughs> well, bear in mind that I will only ask you a question. I will only say that, that in my view, uh, I know something about the US banking system, and I agree with the left wing when they call the bankers the banksters. The banks. <laughs> uh, now, I, I don't think I think that respect for property rights in our in, in our financial system is very low. The U.S. is certainly leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, bondholders, people who had legal rights to bonds having to do with Chrysler and General Motors, were completely thwarted. Uh, we we, uh, we 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 have tightened regulations that make it very difficult for competing banks to, to get involved with banking. Walmart a very much hated organization by uh, the uh, progressives, wants to get into banking in order to provide people of limited means really good banking services, and the banksters prevent that. Uh, so what's my long-winded answer to your question? Well, uh, the, you might want to get involved in banking because it's favored by the state, because the state loves it. What do you think? Well, that's what corny capitalism is all about. That's where the money is. That's where the opportunities are. But, but that doesn't mean there's respect for property rights in my country, respect for banking rights. So that might explain why everybody wants to get in the action. You know? uh, why invest in the Soviet Union? Why invest when, uh, well, you, you're, you're nodding, so I, I, I get some reassurance from that smile and nod. Uh, <laughs> with respect, with respect to, the, uh, to, to the statement that the gentleman in the stash made, I've heard that, and I think that's insightful. We do have, it, what's interesting, you know, all the, the challenges about property, I'm, I'm, I was talking to uh, a, a young man who, who was speaking about 
theatrical opportunity in Bucharest. That Bucharest has seemingly has a hunger for popular shows uh, that uh, um, uh, that uh, that great uh, show, uh, uh, the Phantom of the Opera, was popular in Bucharest, and it only played ten times. But this is the vast opportunity. So I said, well, why don't you rent a theater? Um, I'm saying the stupidest things you ma imaginable. Why don't you try renting a theater and invite touring shows to come to Bucharest? Well. That induced laughter on the part of my audience when I suggested that bright little idea, because property rights are just not respectively challenged. Uh, the uh, young lady in the back. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'm thinking that one explanation of this situation might be also the fact that the legal system is uh, very volatile and unpredictable in Romania. Yeah. And this is a major concern of the business uh, environment mm -hmm. since quite a long time and yeah. uh, the situation doesn't improve, yes. unfortunately. Because you have two aspects, legal system and property rights. Uh, here on the slide you have only property rights, uh, rights but I imagine yes. that on legal system the situation is also bad. Yes. And okay. my, my uh, opinion is uh, that uh, it, it is because um, the, we, we have very uh, often changes in legislation and uh, this raises uh, big uh, challenges for uh, planning uh, business even on uh, medium term. Yes, well thank you for that. Uh, 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 yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I was, I, I, there's so much detail in uh, the, uh, the Economic Freedom Index Again, it's all numbers, and uh, what you just said is absolutely pertinent. This is property rights, and there are other measures of the legal system, uh, a lot of them coming from the World Economic Forum, from the World Bank, where they are attempting to create a mosaic of numbers so that all the possible reliable numbers that they could put in will give them a sense uh, of what is going on. Uh, but I, uh, your statement is quite pertinent, and if you look at the, uh, that the measures of, of legal system, which indeed, as you say, is different. That's why they say legal system and property rights, because there are uh, the whole uh, range of issues, and the issue that you mentioned is quite accurate. I, I do want to speak to you more gen the general point that was made earlier, which is this, that of course, for example, uh, culture matters. Uh, I, my favorite example about culture uh, and I don't think Romania was ever put to this test, but the favorite example about culture is uh, the test that's made where you take uh, uh, wallets and you put a lot of cash in them, and the wallets have identification. So you, you drop the wallets all over a city. In other words, people pick them up with a lot of cash and the names are in the wallets, so you know who to return it to. And so the, the test is how many people, how many wallets get returned? Uh, and that's obviously not a test of economic freedom. It's a test of the culture. My, my, I will only say that my wife, so my wife is Japanese. She's sitting in the back, she's a Japanese artist. And in Japan, all the wallets get returned. Uh, what and, about uh, the United States? What? <laughs> Practically the United States, of course. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm saying? The United States doesn't do as well as, uh, no, but obviously, you know, the, the, the point that's been made by, by, about Thomas, uh, by uh, economists like Thomas Sowell is that, is that when you have, you, you have certain ethnic groups like diamond, Jewish diamond merchants, that, that the, the transactions are so efficient and so trusted that they don't even have to write a contract. You know, the trust is so great. The efficiency of transactions is so great. And so, and so, the, so the, culture, uh, the culture matters. And so I, I want to reflect your point as well, that obviously culture matters, for sure. Uh, and uh, I don't know how well we do in Romania. We could, of course, run the experiment. We just have to put the cash together, get the wallets, the identification, and uh, leave them around the city and see what happens. Uh, but, because we'll, uh, the address will be appropriate to see how it does in Bucharest. But there, but there, that's of course very important. But the point, though, is that given uh, the, the amazing properties of the, uh, of the Economic Freedom Index, are that uh, that that we do find very noticeable correlations. Again, the rankings, the trends. It's ama it's amazing how much it manages to explain. Which is only that, of course, it's making the point that uh, that however good or bad your culture is. Uh, if you have dishonest people in the culture who will keep the wallets, 
the last thing you want them to do is to be in charge of the government. You know, and that's what will happen if there's a guy out of government jobs. You'd rather at least that they be cheating entrepreneurs who are trying to sell you, uh, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge, as we say in the U.S. You know, the, you know, I have a bridge I want to sell you. You know that American joke. You know, stand in front of the Brooklyn Bridge and say, I can sell you this bridge. Give me the money. It's yours. Here's the deed. That's the big fraud. So we want people to do that rather than be in charge of the government. And so therefore, uh, that's why the economic freedom index measure is something I, that I would argue is very important. Well, uh, I'm going to proceed now to indict my own country uh, because I've said enough presumptuous things about yours. Uh, so let's go back to the U.S. Uh, before. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the U.S. has fallen. Yeah, there we go. Okay, yeah. Um, the U.S. has fallen back to 1970 levels. Uh, and, and that's a uh, that that. In, in fact, I mean, I had 1980 up there, as you recall. But of course, because the U.S. is very accessible, they go back to 1970 with the U.S. And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating story from my perspective as an American economist, because there, if you look at the numbers, 1970, you probably should have put them in a bar chart, which I did when I wrote it up for Barron's, but notice it goes up in, from 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, and then from 2000 to 2008, I put that in because that's the, the year uh, before Obama took over, and that's 2013, it's continuing to decline. And, uh, what is intriguing for me and, uh, is that it's a very bipartisan story. Uh, as we Americans would say, it's bipartisan because uh, you had Democratic legislatures, Democratic presidents, Republican presidents, Republican legislatures from 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000. And yet, the Economic Freedom Index continued to rise. Uh, it rose a little bit more slowly from 1990 to 2000, but it did continue to rise. And, uh, it, and although I would insist that, uh, again, this 865 peak is not impressive to me. It's only, it's only a relative marking on a curve kind of number. But the fact that it rose is of interest. And uh, when you, uh, if, if, I, I have to uh, surprise my readers. Uh, many of whom tend to be Republicans and hate Democrats and all the rest, that that even that under Jimmy Carter, who was a Democrat, uh, there was a lot of deregulation. Uh, under Ni Nixon, Richard Nixon, uh, if I'm naming some of you who have heard of, uh, in, in the early 1970s, he was really a very anti-market president, despite being a Republican. He, he imposed wage and price controls. He created regulatory agencies. And then um, 1980 to 1990, we had Ronald Reagan in, um, and George, and, but, but, uh, and, but uh, there, there was no question that a lot of what is credited to Reagan, by the way, started under Carter. Uh, the, the deregulation of the airlines, the deregulation of trucking, a lot of good things happened, from my perspective, uh, that led to, uh, that, that were part of uh, the increase in the index. And a, a new philosophy of greater respect for markets uh, happened. Uh, there was, at the time, of course, uh, in 1970, there still was this basic belief, by the way, uh, which I think affected the entire uh, US economy and the world, that the only way for poor countries to rise out of poverty was to, have, was to, was to go with the socialist model, the Soviet model. But that was their only hope. Uh, but by the 80s and 90s, there was more of an understanding uh, that free markets helped everyone. So uh, there was progress. But then 2000 to 2008, there you have a big decline. And, uh, and, and there, of course, I want to remind my Republican readers that you had a Republican president in the White House, George W. Bush at the time, when the biggest decline occurred. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, again, it's a, it's a bipartisan story. Uh, and the fall under Obama, actually, year by year, has actually been s slower. It has been a continued decline. Obama hasn't reversed it. The last thing he's interested in doing is caring about this kind of measure. That's not his thing. Uh, but uh, it did fall uh, more slowly uh, uh, over this period. Uh, the, uh, the US you know, fell in rankings from 6th to 16th. Part of the reason for that was good news. Other countries rose. Uh, so therefore, uh, it, uh, it was good news in a way. But we're now 16th in the world. Um, now, next slide. Um, yeah, all five components fell. Although there too, legal system and security of property rights fell the fastest of all the of all the components. Uh, again, the most important. Uh, and then next slide. 
Uh, now there, uh, I'm uh, in, in uh, let's pause for a moment just to look at those numbers. Hopefully they're not too uh, uh, overwhelming. Uh, there, I'm just measuring the change uh, in the first column from in, the, in, the, in, the, in the decades and then from 20, 2000 to 2013. I'm measuring the increase or decrease in the economic freedom index. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, inc the increase was actually a little bit more slow in the 90s. Uh, but then alongside uh, that, I'm measuring the uh, growth in gross domestic product. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, argument on all sides of, of the aisle and of the ideological, ideological spectrum about why US uh, economic growth has slowed. And uh, I believe that uh, the Economic Freedom Index uh, and its trend is the most decisive explanation for why it happened. Uh, and uh, my key point uh, is, again, something that doesn't make me popular, is that the slowdown began in the year 2000. It, it's not just under Obama, the, the president everybody, uh, every, many of my readers love to hate, uh, and, uh, or the, the, the president that some of my readers like to admire, George W. Bush, the decline of, uh, in growth began then. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and no matter how you measure it, by the way, uh, with respect to economic growth, the decline started under Bush, and there were, and, and if you begin to look at some of the things that happened under Bush, the uh, lack of respect for property rights. See, I mean, Bush's favorite, famous statement when the 08-09 recession began, he was president then, you know, we have to, uh, what is it, we have to, uh, we have to, Forgive me, I'm not going to be able to capture it. We, it was something that, we, in order to save the free market system, we have to just give up on property rights, or worse to that effect. In order to save the free market system, we've got to come to the rescue of, of the big banks. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the housing bubble uh, that, uh, that brought about the Great Recession, uh, it was started under Clinton, but it really achieved virulence under George W. Bush. The, the, the delusion on the part of government that everyone could own a home. Uh, and uh, it's like, you know, well, that's great. We should all own a home. Let's all own a Rolls Royce by that logic. Uh, let's, let's make sure that everybody is in debt to, to making car payments on a Rolls Royce and on a house. George W. Bush was very much, was just as in favor of this as uh, anybody, as Clinton was. Uh, he pushed it hard. He, he brought, helped bring about the housing bubble. Uh, he, uh, he actually talked about inequality. He said, we have inequality of housing in this country. We've got to, make, we've got to give you the down payment. We've got to finance you. Uh, he was very much a part of, uh, of the calamity that brought about uh, the Great Recession uh, and, uh, the, uh, and, and, and the bust and uh, that affected most of the world. Uh, and so we have slowed from uh, growth of more than 3%, uh, which includes all the recessions of those periods, to 1.7% growth. And I believe that that has a lot to do with our, that the core explanation, and we could go into all of the many explanations that have been put forward, and I could point out why they're lacking, because part of the point is that they missed the point. The slowdown started in 2000, 2001. Uh, and that, so any explanation you provide for the slowdown should take into account the entire 13-year period uh, when the slowdown began. Uh, and, uh, but of course, many of the explanations just basically talk about the period since 09 or 10, and, and 10, not the entire 13 year period. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, you're ahead of me again. Uh, the, again, just an excursion into the myth of socialism in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Sweden. Uh, this is the 2014 data for legal system and property rights. Uh, and uh, it shows that Norway, Denmark, and Sweden are all three of them. Uh, more than a, a, a point or more ahead of the U.S. and uh, Romania is uh, far behind the U.S. as well uh, in property rights, and we're certainly getting some good insights from your from the remarks that you have made about why that's the case. And uh, I, 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 when I'm hearing about the challenges to property, I like to think that that maybe will pass in time, and that uh, it's not going to continue forever. The fact that it's almost impossible to be secure in your property rights, which means, of course, that 
when I told this young man, well, why don't you, do, why don't you rent a theater or buy one and then sponsor touring shows because there's such a vast amount of money to be made in touring shows coming to Romania. It's popular in Hamburg, popular in London, uh, popular all over the world. The Lion King, uh, Phantom of the Opera, all of those shows that Romanians would like to attend. But he said such things are impossible and uh, those property rights are not secure. Uh, well, that gets it back to the property rights uh, Colin, uh, the other one, uh, yeah, actually, next slide. Um, uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this was this was another, uh, th this gets back to the uh, comment the young lady made. I'd forgotten that I actually th did include another survey. Uh, again, uh, I believe that this is compelling stuff because these are executives of Romanian companies talking. And uh, here the question was, uh, in your country, how independent is the judicial system from influences of the government, individuals, or companies? Um, and um, in Romania, Romania actually did a little bit better on the, on the property rights, but there too, it was uh, way behind uh, countries like the US and Norway. Uh, and it was 4.0, so it's tilted a little bit positively, but clearly, uh, you might, I mean, I, I don't know if there's, if there's much interest in sort of, sort of seeing the spread. This, that's, of course, the average, a weighted average of the responses that the executives get. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think it's very telling uh, that uh, they apparently they're not confident in the independence of the judicial system by and large compared uh, to the kinds of answers you get. That's why, as you can see, it's all marked on a curve. It tends to be comparative, uh, and uh, and uh, and I, I would admit, of course, that you might say there's a bias. Then what kind of what, what kind of standards these executives have? But still, I think that in other words, you might say, well, the Romanian executives have a certain standard for fairness. But still, there's a lot of more a lot of global awareness in the world, and so I would say that when these executives say that the uh, that the independence is not very great, that uh, not dependent at all, entirely independent. That it's more or less midway. I would say that that has some reliability, although again, of course, the question regresses back to what that young lady was talking about. Why are they saying this? Well, again, the Economic Freedom Index wants to be objective and say this is the report and this is this that is the, what the measure gets. Uh, but of course, the question is why? Because the most important thing is what can we do about it? Uh, how can uh, a, a question? for these people when they're answering <laughs> this survey would be, what do you propose be done uh, about the lack of independence? Uh, the uh, one final, I want to just go over a couple of the other guts of it. In, in terms of regulation, uh, there's a, the labor uh, regulation uh, for Romania was of interest. Uh, the question asked of the executives is, in your country, to what extent do regulations allow flexible hiring and firing of workers? Uh, you know, my, uh, I, I hate to see people get fired. Uh, you know, I'm, I've never been a capitalist, I'm just a wage earner. Uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, it's uh, horrible when people get fired, but uh, as a friend of mine who uh, started a business declared uh, once, uh, every business should say, if I can't fire you, I can't hire you. Because, you know, if, uh, if I can't divorce you, I can't marry you. Uh, no, otherwise there's slavery. And as you know, of course, I certainly know in, in so many, uh, there was recently an article uh, by a disgruntled official of the United Nations saying the problem with the UN and why it gets nothing done is you can't fire anybody. You have people on high levels who are incompetent and nobody can get fired. The school system in the US, nobody gets fired. The worst incompetence, the, uh, the, uh, nobody can get removed. And uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, ultimately, uh, I was fired from a job once. It was the best thing that happened to me, uh, by the way. And, uh, no, so you're not suited. You're not getting along with the boss. This institution is lousy. Uh, might as well get fired. Why not? Uh, but, and obviously, every institution should have a right to fire you. Uh, because otherwise, they're going to be hesitant to hire you. And what they're going to do is going to bring in contingent workers. And they're going to work around it in all kinds of ways. Uh, because they don't want to be stuck with people they can't get rid of. Uh, they, but so that's why it's ridiculous. And in the case of Romania, uh, you may know more about it than I. The executives uh, gave it a relatively low rating. Hong Kong was number one. You can fire anybody there, I guess. Although who knows? Maybe they, they, that measure, by the way, 5.7, was still way short of seven, which is interesting. Uh, 
And uh, so it's not to a great extent, even in Hong Kong, but better in the US. Uh, and then um, the flexibility of wage determination is the final one, subcomponent of regulation. In your country, how are wages generally set by a cent centralized bargaining process and by each individual company is seven. Those are the extremes. Uh, Romania actually didn't do, uh, it, uh, in terms of, in, in relation, it's 59th, which isn't high, but in relation to the US and Hong Kong, the gap was not huge uh, uh, for what that's worth, although it was, it was lower, and so it didn't do as well. Uh, now, okay, finally, uh, the, uh, the, the, the empirical rule has to do, that has to do with why the US is suffering is that, is that empirical data shows, and again, this is, uh, I'm wary of all quantification. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, uh, somebody might be able to correct me, but when a recent study appeared, uh, that appears every year, saying that the happiest people are the people who live in Denmark, uh, I, I just wonder how they could possibly determine that. I, I believe that you, know, you can determine these things, like economic freedom, because, they, because it does have to do with things that tend to be quantitative. You are asking executives. The, the idea of asking people how happy are you, and determining their degree of happiness, Seems ridiculous. We we do have a world slightly gone mad with numbers and with with quantifying way too many things that can't be quantified. Uh, I'm I'm of the Austrian school. I don't think that when I read in a textbook that you can actually quantify the marginal utility in terms of utils. That's a measure that you find in the textbook. Utils. How much how much utils are you getting out of a particular good? Uh, I think that's ridiculous. There's no such thing as measuring utility. Uh, and so, again, I'm a skeptic with respect to measuring, uh, but I believe that this gross approximation of economic freedom uh, does uh, have robust qualities, is reasonably good, and I would say that this general statement, that plus or minus one point in economic freedom index, the U.S. has lost more, uh, almost a point since 2000. It's gone down by almost a point. Uh, equates to plus or minus one of uh, one point five points in long-term growth of real gross domestic product, and one percent of real gross domestic product. Uh, certainly, if you compound it over ten years, it adds up to a lot. It's worth a great deal. Uh, and so, again, I would conclude. Uh, write me there uh, if you have questions that aren't going to be answered today. But I would conclude that the Economic Freedom Index does capture a significant part of reality that we as economists care about. Uh, and because uh, I come from a school that, that, is, uh, that, that, that believes that we economists should not be running the economy. I come from the Hayekian school that, as Hayek said, if I think I can do this quote justice, that it is the peculiar task of economics uh, to teach people how little they know about what's important. And that, that, the, that essentially knowledge about the economy comes from the broad economy, it comes from the entrepreneurs who are de on a decentralized basis searching for opportunity, uh, and that the Economic Freedom Index, which emphasizes freedom, which is really, the Economic Freedom Index is really a synonym for the word capitalist freedom, uh, that it, it tells us a whole lot about what makes an economy, an economy successful and what makes it less successful. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, I hope you have some more comments, questions, insults, quarrels. Uh, the gentleman who just raised his hand, I frequently talk to, so I'm going to defer to somebody else who might have a question or comment, uh, unless uh, he uh, is the only one to start the ball rolling. Uh, anybody else? Comment, question, argument? But yes, please. I have a, a small question for your wife, which I know. For my wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we say in Romania that behind a great man is a great woman. Oh, so thank you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You have a very beautiful painting called Neither Yes Nor No. And my, uh, what is the question of uh, that painting? It's very blue. It's like uh, the world economy is getting blue. <laughs> you have a painting? Yes. Neither yes nor no. What is the question? In my, it's a general question, or it's uh, the person uh, who is looking to the painting? Because when I saw, it's a very beautiful blue tone. So I thought maybe it's like world economy is getting blue. 
Economy. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's a joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a question for what does it represent that but lady? I think a lot of times I title uh, my work uh, not exactly describing what the painting is about, but relating to somewhere so that I do not like uh, uh, cement the uh, idea. Okay. In the uh, uh, whatever a viewer, the viewer has to figure out. But I like a, such a, um, a title that um, many important things are in between. Okay. Not so much black and white. So when I look at your painting, I thought as an economist that the word economy is <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the session. Thank you for your question. And uh, what is that painting selling for, honey? I just wanted to crack an economist question. <laughs> <laughs> the paintings are twelve hundred on that, but because of that <laughs> question, you get ten percent off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I gather more people want to ask my wife questions. I completely understand. She's a lot more interesting than I am. Sure. And uh, but uh, any other questions for me or my wife? But, but the question is also for you. Is yeah. uh, the yes. economy getting blue? Uh, the, like the situation is is getting worse in one Yes. Country. Yes. Well, definitely. Well, indeed. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll, I'll try answering that question. Yes. Absolutely. Is the economy getting blue? Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, it, it does appear uh, that, uh, although it's a mixed bag, certainly from a US-centric perspective, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I believe that the likely next president uh, will be Hillary Clinton, uh, for fairly obvious reasons. He's got the Democratic nomination locked up, and, uh, and, and, uh, the, and even if Trump gets the nomination, Certainly, there'll be a problem uh, with uh, with his winning. I think she'll he'll, she, he'll be even if she does get the nomination, he might not. So, if she does get the nomination, I don't think that she's going to uh, take initiatives uh, to to, uh, to be very concerned. She's not inviting me to the White House to lecture her, to give her, to deliver her this lecture, and tell her, look, the only what you must do is stand aside and get the economic freedom index up. She's not going to listen to me. Uh, and she probably will be hampered by uh, a Republican-dominated uh, Congress, uh, but still, it, there's not going to be progress. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, Camille's telling me the Republican-dominated Congress won't. Yeah, there's going to be a Republican-dominated okay. okay. Congress. But, uh, but, but certainly, certainly, there's been the, the, the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of, uh, uh, to, to a limited, more limited degree, of Bernie Sanders, who was, you know, constantly talks about how. Uh, I would like to tell Bernie, uh, particularly since some people have mistaken me for Bernie when I uh, go around New York, since I've been called a Bernie Sanders lookalike. Uh, and, uh, I've, uh, I would like to tell Bernie that if you want to respect Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, then let's have more property rights. You know, let's have less regulation. Let's let, let's do what. The, 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 by the way, the, the, the president of Denmark specifically repudiated Bernie Sanders' statement that his so he said no we we have a market economy and what they do have of course is a very extensive uh, 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 welfare state which I think has its flaws but certainly it helps if you're you know just a, if, if if you're if, if it's a homogeneous country of de of Danes and they probably will return the wallets you know the Dan the Danes the Swedes uh, they tend to be hardworking so uh, but uh, getting back to your question uh, it does appear uh, that. Uh, that economic freedom uh, index, which rose globally fairly substantially in the 90s for many countries, that it's slowing, and there's a, and that and that the the uh, the economic insecurity that that is being felt by many workers in the U.S. Uh, because of a slow economic freedom index, because of slow growth, uh, uh, I believe, is rebounding. Where then they suddenly become fearful of competition from abroad. Now, in my view. Uh, the best thing for poor people is uh, is, is global uh, globalization, international trade. Why? Because go, go, because think Walmart. Walmart essentially imports cheap goods from China from other countries, and it sells those cheap goods to American workers. Rich people benefit actually far less, as consumers at least, from global trade. And yet, uh, the, uh, the, the Obama, by the way, was part of this uh, kind of myth as well. When he was campaigning against Romney, he bragged about the fact that he kept cheap Chinese tires out of the country. 
you know, the Chinese, so, so let, let the average American pay more for his tires. The, the, the average American who owns a car pay more for his tires, that's an achievement because people tend to think of themselves as workers and they don't tend to think of themselves as consumers. They don't recognize the enormous benefit and obviously the enormous benefit to Chinese people and to, and to other poor people around the world that, they, that they're earning uh, a, 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 for them a decent wage uh, with an American-owned uh, factory or factories that supply Walmart. Uh, but uh, all of those things are, are, are swept aside and all that Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders talks about is that the Chinese are stealing our jobs. Uh, and, uh, and people uh, respond and, uh, with fear and xenophobia and ignorance. And uh, Trump and Bernie Sanders prey upon those fears. And uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, now, actually, Hillary, Hillary Clinton is a little bit better in the respect in, in that she did vote for trade agreements, although they had, they had a funny argument at one point, Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, um, when um, Hillary Clinton was bragging about the fact that she voted for, uh, uh, sub, for continuing uh, to finance the Export-Import Bank. Now, the Export-Import Bank in the U.S. is a crony capitalist institution. It basically uh, subsidizes uh, big corporations that enables them to export, uh, Boeing and others companies that enable them to export. These big corporations should not be welfare recipients of government. Taxpayers should not be paying for them, uh, and, uh, and yet that's what the Export Import Bank is all about. And she voted for renewing it, and she said to Bernie Sanders, I saved American jobs by voting for a renewal of the Export Import Bank, and you voted against it, Bernie. And Bernie answered her and said, that's a crony capitalist corrupt system. And that's why I didn't vote for it. It's my Bernie Sanders invitation. Um, and, uh, and so he was actually right in that case. You know, he was right. Uh, he has, he's a funny mixture of, uh, of, of hatred of, of capitalism. And yet his instincts are right about crony capitalism, about the evils of crony capitalism. But again, uh, a long-winded answer to, uh, to your very good question, which is that I'm not optimistic uh, but, but still, I mean, in the broad sweep of history, the last 50 years, the last 100 years, uh, I believe that uh, freedom and free markets tend to prevail. They tend to be more sensible. Uh, people ultimately, the failures of, uh, of, of the Soviet Union, uh, the failures of communism generally, even though, of course, I ask any Romanian I meet these days, uh, why are so many people nostalgic uh, for, the, uh, for the time under Ceausescu? Maybe you, maybe you have some, maybe some of you can enlighten me more about that. Um, but anyway, we have any other question until we go? Okay, Camille, yes. Coming to the US for, uh, I mean, coming yeah. to Romania four years ago, I was puzzled, and this is a, an observation basically, that in New York, I had only one a choice of a, one cable company. Mm -hmm. yeah. It yeah. was regulated. Coming here, I had the uh, choice between three companies, and I was surprised that uh, you know, coming in a country that supposedly was closer to a socialist system, they already achieved a, 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 a field of uh, having more competition, more than the U.S. that pride themselves with the, uh, you know. Uh, Sanders said that uh, internet is better in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> At, at my age, it, it's hard to say, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, Sanders, you said, yes. Yeah, and and, and the just to remark, uh, they're not going to be any... They're going to lose with the Trump, they're going to lose the Senate, and the House. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, well, okay. I mean, that, uh, that could be the case. Uh, no, indeed, I, I, I was stepping uh, beyond my, uh, my pay grade by making a, a political forecast. I gather that uh, Camille, who lives in Romania, has a much better feel for American politics than I have. Uh, and I take it you agree that Hillary will probably become the president? Yeah. And you see what, what the sad face I have. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, any other final, any penultimate, any ultimate? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. A question around uh, the link between economic freedom and uh, well-being. Do you have any insights around that? Yes, uh, there, 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 there was certainly uh, longevity. Uh, you know, I mean, bear in mind that when you talk about well-being, I do tend to hesitate because I've never been persuaded by the happiness research. Uh, and uh, but uh, but certainly, uh, if, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, in, uh, in terms of well-being, if you can measure the more objective indicators of health, uh, 
then uh, certainly uh, there, there, there it actually was a recent article in uh, the Fraser Institute's annual report on that very thing that uh, longevity and indicators of health are generally better. Uh, although again, uh, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, getting back to my hobby horse as well about culture, uh, the culture matters. And uh, we, for example, we so often have indicted the US healthcare, medical care system. I don't like to call it the healthcare system. I like to call it the medical care system because healthcare really takes place mostly outside the medical care system. When you go to a restaurant, when you take care of yourself and so on. The US uh, has uh, worse measures of well-being, but that's because you know, you know, we're a crazy society. You know, we have a lot of drunks, a lot of addicts, a lot of criminals, uh, a lot of violence. You know, so uh, I, don't, I can't blame that on our medical care system or blame that on our economy. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we libertarians, one of my favorite statements of a libertarian is, each man has a right to go to hell in his own fashion. <laughs> and so we, we allow for that. Although, certainly, getting back to your question, uh, there was, in fact, an article that addressed that very question having to do with, with, uh, with measures of health. And, uh, and I, of course, I do tend to believe that people are happier uh, when they have access to the internet, when they have uh, uh, DVD players, and when they go to the movies, go to the theater, uh, have more freedom of speech, not be fearful of, uh, of government. Uh, I do tend to believe that's conducive to happiness, but that's just a belief, something more difficult for me to prove. But yes, there is, uh, it, it does correlate with, with increased measures of work. Uh, anyway. Well, um, I think I've worn out my welcome uh, anyway, uh, and uh, I thank you for your uh, polite attention and for your incisive comments. Thanks very much. Thank you.